Welcome to the 615 Sessions podcast. Always happy to be with you guys for another week of discussion. We got Mr. Monday Night himself, Keith Bullock, in the house hanging out here with us. KB, always a pleasure. Live, live on the scene from Just Love <laughs> out in Franklin. How are we living today? Good, man. Yeah, I'm out here um, at my shop in the last little hour of a shift hopefully uh we don't get any <laughs> get any orders but uh it's all good i got a great guy on on staff right now well listen if, if we gotta if we gotta let you go to sling lattes and help shut it down you just let us know you wave the bat signal and we'll uh we'll make it happen but we do appreciate you stopping by it's a big week for the titans colts coming up uh afc south rivalry always going to be a big uh, discussion point is that the biggest division rival that you guys had during your time who was that for you yeah I I would say when I first got here uh, I was in that black and blue division with Pittsburgh Baltimore Cleveland ourselves Um, so you know I came in it was those guys those are our rivalries Uh, and the Colts rivalry was fairly new but it wasn't until it wasn't too it didn't take too long for that to be one of our rivals, especially once we um, formed the AFC South was formed and it went from the central uh, to the south. So, yeah, it was tough to uh, beat those guys with Peyton Manning, Edwin James, Marvin Harrison, let alone get a split. Um, so, you know, this Titans team to go up there and have five in a row at their house uh that that's huge and you know it kind of um shows a dominance of kind of the Colts and just shows you know the type of team they've been in this afc south with command of it pretty much since uh mike vrabel took over for mike malarkey so i mean we know that these things ebb and flow and, and the league is so successfully built for for parity kb the idea that they would continue not just to have this streak over the colts but that's five straight that they've won at lucas oil which is kind of crazy to think about. There's, It's so hard to win in the NFL, so hard to win on the road. But for them to be able to have have that kind of a streak going, we'll see what, what Sunday holds. But uh, that's that's as impressive, uh, 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 I guess, a, a, a level of competition from them as I've seen against anybody else, given how skewed it's been for so long in Indianapolis' favor. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it just gives this team um, a, an extra sense of confidence going in there, regardless who's at the quarterback position. But them playing against Anthony Richardson, who is actually playing better than I would have expected uh, in his rookie season in only three games, he showed that he can go out there and he can do some things with his legs and his arms. And he's not afraid of the moment so far. So i um, I just hope that, um, you know, the Titans go out there. They're able to um, impose their will on the Colts and not let this young uh, quarterback continue with this process of getting um, confidence as he plays more and more. That's exactly what they did against the Bengals. Uh, You were there, saw you, saw you in the bowels (laughs) of the stadium. I got to apologize to to you because um, I was like, yo, Buck, Buck, I'm not much of a hype man. And then, uh, yeah, you're like, yeah, you are, KB. Yeah, you are. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not. But then, um, you know, people told me I did a pretty good job as a hype man. So I was about to say. I guess you know your talent. This man, this man sitting here trying to talk, talk me down like you're, there is a reason the Titans legend Keith Bullock is in the building. Maybe you're not going to break the mic like Jarrell did the other day. <laughs> but I thought you got people going pre- just fine in the fourth quarter. You're not giving yourself enough credit. Yeah, you know what? I didn't really know what to expect. And, um, you know, thanks to, you know, uh, Titans Public Relations uh, for helping me through it. They are just pretty like, they're pretty much like, Jarrell Casey broke the mic last week because he was screaming so loud. He's like, they're like, you don't have to scream. Just speak into it and people are going to hear you. I didn't really know what to say. I kind of went with the night with the Warriors. You know, can you dig it? Shaquille O'Neal made it famous too when the Lakers won. And then... They were kicking their butt, so it was like, yo, it's a wrap. And then I saw Joe Burrow kind of just standing there, like, looking like, man, hurry up and get off this. So I was <laughs> like, that's what made me say Joe Burrow's name. Yo, you're a great player, but whatever. And then I seen um, uh, Jeffrey Simmons, and then I went to him, and then I was like, Coach Rabel, 
you go. I don't even know, man. It was just a moment. You know what I mean? There was absolutely a moment at Nissan Stadium. Uh, Keith Bullock hanging out here with us on the 615 Sessions podcast. Podcast presented by the great folks at Two Rivers Ford. Powered by Ford, driven by people. Um, so I mean, you saw you saw them. We kicked the Bengals' ass at, at Nissan Stadium on on Sunday afternoon after being pretty thoroughly embarrassed in Cleveland. KB, I know you guys break it down on on Sunday nights on News Channel Five with Burton and Layman and, and Hutton and the whole crew. What what shifted the most for you from one twenty seven uh, to three result to the one that they saw on Sunday against Cincinnati? Well, I think, um, you know, to tell you the truth, man, Cincinnati's first drive was very impressive, man. At one point, I felt, I don't want to say it, but I felt as if I saw Big Jeff going backwards on his back after, you know, um, you know, the running back was able to, uh, Mixon was able to get like a 12-11 yard game. I'm like, man, it's going to be kind of crazy. And they held him to three, and I think that was big. They, the Titans had an answer this week, and I think what went wrong with Cleveland, they didn't have an answer. I think that they were they weren't locked in. They weren't as locked in as they were this week. You know, they didn't give up the big play that uh, Cincinnati saw on film and was ready to kind of obviously keep their offense going. Other than you know, instead of that, uh, the D line did a great job of keeping you know Joe. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, Joe Burrow off of his spot and not able to throw it um, as well offensively. Um, I feel like a, a great game plan was called. You know, there's no reason to have two, one of the best backs in the league and then another rookie that's shown some flashes and not put them out there at the same time to give the defense more to think about. You know, it's not like, you know, Ryan Tannehill is going to throw for 300 yards a game. You know what I mean? So uh, you got to put a running game together with him with, with whatever 150 plus he's able to muster. And that comes through the, you know, the, the game plan. So I just think um, the Titans players as well as coaching staff was fully locked in going into this game and Cleveland kind of helped them uh, get on track in that sense. So it also shows that how week to week the NFL is this yeah. year. I mean, it's crazy. There's 12 teams in the league uh, before Thursday Night Football. We're taping a podcast today. Uh, there's 12 teams in the NFL that are 2-2. Two and two. Titans and Colts are two of them. The whole AFC South is 2-2 two and two right now, so anybody can get got at any given point for certain. Uh, it was as, as good a performance as they've, as well-rounded a performance as they've had, though, Keith. And, and defense, obviously, we all have high expectations for them. Standard of Tennessee Titans defense, I don't have to tell you, it's very, very high. Uh, even even when the the teams don't have the most competitive seasons, defense is always something that has been the standard here. And you know, it's it's uh, not not just the guys up front in particular. Like Jeff gets obviously you know no, fairly a lot of accolades, but I was so impressed with both inside backers uh, in this game. Watching Al Sher, Aziz Al Sher, and Jack Gibbons, who. You know, he may not be the most sudden athlete, but I think that he's always in good position. He seems to be a, a pretty heady player when I watch him when I watch him back in these games, KB. And I wonder what you think of the the guys that they have in the middle of the defense right now. Well, um, you know, Aziz Al Share Share Shire Share. I keep on getting it mixed up. But uh, you know, he came he played, he was the third linebacker on a very good San Francisco defense with the good San Francisco linebacking core, you know. So that being said, uh he made some plays there when he got the opportunity, but then coming here, um Rand Carthon being familiar with him, uh, giving him the opportunity to come here, be a leader, uh, I'll say a leader because he's a captain in his first year here uh, with the team, that shows and says a lot about him. So you already know um, and assume what you're getting in him. They paid him money. And Jeff Gibbons, he was a guy that was here last year and was forced into action because um, there, you know, the different injuries that they had with that middle linebacker position. And, um, this year, he came into camp, um, actually, the spring with a whole different mindset. You know, he got to have a full spring, whereas last year he came in at the end of camp uh, figuring he's going to play a backup role or, you know, some, in a lot of special teams. This year, he's like, look, okay, I'm in a position to have a starting role. I'm going to compete. So it's a different mindset, a different mentality that you take into the, into the season. And um, obviously – 
going into the season, I believe there was two or three. I let's just stick with him and Monty Rice. You know, um, yeah. those are the two names that you kept hearing, um, him and Monty Rice. And then, you know, then another name uh, would come up in there, but the consistent name was uh, Jack Gibbons. So whatever he was doing was good enough. And it, and you know. It also, that's what I'm saying, that he definitely came into the season with the mindset that, look, this is my position to lose, and I think he did a great job. That's phase one. Now phase two is, all right, you know, the coaches aren't going to put him in positions that aren't going to favor him. They're not going to probably ask him to go out and cover um, the running back. You saw Aziz did that against um, – the Cleveland Browns, you know, with the sluggo that went for a touchdown. But, you know, either way, they're, you're going to put your most athletic guy in that position. And I think Jack Gibbons and Aziz Alshire, they complement each other fairly well because obviously Aziz has all the, the athleticism you want. But um, Jack Gibbons is Mr. Reliable because he's going to be where you need to be and he can make the every down football plays. Hanging out here on the 615 Sessions podcast with Mr. Monday Night. Mr. Monday Night on a Thursday afternoon from Just Love, uh, Keith Bullock. The podcast is, of course, presented by Relax the Back. Relaxtheback.com for all your standing desk mattress pillow needs. If you're not sleeping well enough at night, Relax the Back has you covered. Um, I think that when I look at this team, Keith, and as you said, this it's going to be it's going to be week to week every week this year in the NFL, particularly in the AFC South, super congested Titans in a, in an interesting spot, trying to straddle one generation. It feels like of Titans football that's featured prominently Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill between and whatever comes next, right? With Malik Willis and Will Levis on the roster, Tajay Spears now coming in. And, you know, as somebody who's among some of the greatest players to have ever played for this franchise, Watching Derek do uh, do what he did on Sunday afternoon against Cincinnati, we've all seen it so many times before. But to pass Earl Campbell um, on the second all-time leading rusher list, just uh, about fourteen hundred yards behind Eddie for all time, I-, I wonder what you make of Derek watching that play out in real time from from a different vantage point than the playing field. Yeah, no, um, it, it's been kind of cool, man. It, it's been kind of cool to see how Derek's career has played out and the irony that, you know, they're going back to London. And I remember <clears throat> Eddie and I are sitting up in the box at Wembley Stadium, you know, watching the game. And it was like a third and one or a third and two and the handoff that Derek got and he kind of turned down the safety in the hole and like Eddie and I would look at each other like whoa you know I looked at and then Eddie like immediately he got pissed off he's like nah we can't have that nah that's not that's not acceptable and that's just like if you and I were sitting there and you know you noticed a young broadcaster that you know you wanted to have success make a mistake and you're like nah I'm gonna gonna get him right normally I wouldn't do this but I'm going to step in in this situation. And that's what I looked at. That's how I looked at it because, you know, that's the type of player Eddie was when we played. Um, and, you know, obviously everybody knows about the talk. But then as you go on to see how, you know, Derek has, you know, come out of his shell, has become his own person, has become and emerged, um, he went straight to the king, you know what I mean, realizing that, look, the, the records that he set in high school and the records that he set in college – um, you know, that, that that came for a certain reason. So I think that would be a great question to ask Derek um, at some point. Like, you know, how did he get to this point? Because he's definitely one of the greatest running backs in Titans history, Titans Oilers history, now passing the great Earl Campbell. And people were saying in the first couple games, they felt like, no, Derek Henry's losing the step. I never saw that. I never felt that. He has to get his opportunities. You know, Titans football has played a certain way on offense. Um, and, and, you know, the game against Cleveland, there was really no opportunity to get Derrick going. You know, Jim Schwartz is going to play man-to-man, dare you to beat him on the outside and stop the run. So um, I think that, um, you know, the game plans are starting to look um, become more crisp. Um, but like we said, they're week to week. You know, we'll see yeah. what we get this week against the Colts. But it seems as if they found a formula to gain yardage, to get success. Uh, you know, Max Protect, take a shot, might be back in the playbook this week. You know, you just can't do it every week. So uh, I think uh, 
Derrick Henry, if he gets the opportunity and um, they bring him back next year, he'll definitely be one of the greatest Titans running backs and players in history and looking at a Hall of Fame career. Certainly things trending that way. Uh, and uh, now with Tajay Spears, it seems like Derrick Henry can be a more sustainable version of himself as they try and find different ways to, to break it up for, uh, not just for, for Derrick, but try to keep the defense on its heels, as you mentioned earlier in the pod. Uh, with, with that being said, Colts hate week. People are juiced. People are live streaming, uh, watching the podcast today. They're all fired up to have Mr. Monday Night on a podcast. What, what's your favorite memory of playing the Colts uh, in a game where you got them? Um, I think the first time ever playing them because uh, it was a year we started off one and four. Uh, my first year starting, um, we didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. Me, Tank Williams, a young Albert Haynesworth, Samari Roll. Um, yeah, we beat them up pretty bad. And uh, I remember um, Tank, we had a double blitz off the outside, a double dog blitz off the outside. And Tank hit Peyton from the blind side and knocked the ball out. I scooped it and I scored and I high stepped from like the 30 into the end zone. <laughs> um, and, you know, we just had a great time. But ever since then, you know, that's what was so great about Peyton Manning because that blitz worked that one time and never worked. Never worked again. Even if he thought that blitz was coming, he would move the running back over. Be like, hey, get over, get over. So, um, you know, that was um, it. Was always great playing against Peyton because he was always going to make you work for, you know, anything you got. And I think I made that was one of maybe the three or four plays that I ever made, big plays I ever made against Peyton Manning, and I had to work for them all. So, um, yeah, it was always cool. It always brought out. Uh, best in you because you always want to play against the best um and it didn't matter if we we're getting our ba brains beat in or we were beating them up uh we always got uh the best of each other or the best out of each other well you can certainly get the best to keith bullock on sunday nights on news channel five you can hear him on titans tonight on titans radio on 104.5 the zone you can even see him on a sideline near you getting the people hype in the fourth quarter or maybe even adjust it just love if you're on your way to get your coffee. Oh, yeah, maybe sure. I appreciate you stopping by, man. It's good to have you on the podcast, and uh, we'll have to chop it up again.